Hello there, and welcome to another edition of the Super 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 Kick Mania Pro Wrestling Podcast. My name is David Postansky, and on today's episode, we're going to do things ever slightly different than what we've done in the past. And if I think it works, if the response and feedback is good, then we'll perhaps do it again like this in the future. Because today, I'm going to talk about one or two bigger stories, and then just have a little look at the wrestling news, the wrestling Twitter. Pick out some stories that I want to pass my thoughts and comments on. I'm literally not just going to be reading new stories to you, but I'm going to be giving you the background on what the story is and some passing thoughts on it. (coughs) Excuse me. So, the main story I would like to begin with today is to talk about Big Popper Pump, Scott Steiner. Yes, Scotty Steiner has been in the news uh, recently, this last couple of days, just because he was at a... Uh, Impact Wrestling taping, and I think it was their TNA uh, anniversary uh, comeback show, whatever you have it. So if you're not a fan of Impact, it used to be known as TNA Wrestling for still the majority of its life, and uh, they were doing a like a reunion special where it was all going to be branded TNA rather than Impact Wrestling, uh, as it was their original name, and they'd bring back some older stars from the past. One of which, I gather, was Big Popper Pomp, Scott Steiner. And the news goes that he collapsed backstage. Uh, I think he'd done a segment outside the front. I don't think they've aired this yet. In fact, I'm certain they haven't. And he was backstage after having done it, so I don't know if he'd got into anything physical in front of the cameras in the ring, but uh, he then collapsed backstage, and he was hospitalised and you'd see the tweets coming out from Nick Aldis, uh, the current NWA World Heavyweight Champion, and then um, other people just wishing Scott Steiner a speedy recovery. And then uh, yesterday, as I'm speaking, there was tweets from Tommy Dreamer, which is like, you know, they're playing around with the whole Steiner maths thing, which I'll get to momentarily, just like playing around the fact that uh, there's such a high percentage chance that he's going to be absolutely fine. Which is really good news, so not that I expect Scott Steiner or uh, Rick Steiner or any of the Steiner family to be listening to this particular podcast, but if you are, um, everyone here at the Superkick Mania Pro Wrestling Podcast and the Extended Extreme Improv Podcast Network family uh, wish Scott Steiner a speedy recovery. But let's let's talk a little bit, uh, just to get into things, and I don't mean them to ever get controversial, but we will just discuss um, what we know about the situation and concerns over Scott Steiner's health and well-being. Uh, and it's going to come straight on to, I'm not going to tiptoe around it, straight on to the worrying aspects that I'm sure a lot of pro wrestling fans had come to mind when they saw about this, is that obviously Scott Steiner is and has been for a lot of his career a very like big muscle like jacked up ripped guy and for a very very long time it's been expected and suspected that he's used steroids to help achieve that now if you look at um Scott Steiner from the perhaps even the late 1980s up to the latter half of the 1990s he was like a big dude with like big muscles and things, but then when he took on the persona of Big Pop Pump, when he joined the uh, NWO in WCW, he was suddenly the genetic freak, as was well said. And it's you know when they talk about in, you know he's genetically enhanced, basically. So they weren't even really hiding the fact that yeah he's he's enhanced. This is steroids, and and that's worrying. I, I'm not going to preach about. You know, our oh, steroids, they should have been banned, people should get into trouble and stuff like this, although that, that probably is true. Um, what I'm going to focus on is that, it, you know, it makes me worried as a pro wrestling fan. I've been a pro wrestling fan since I was four years old. And I've seen too many wrestlers, you know, die young. And, you know, hopefully Scott Steiner is going to be absolutely fine and they're going to keep a close eye on his health. But just for me... A few years ago, I met the Ultimate Warrior in uh, a very, very rare appearance connected to WWE shortly before he died. Just about a few months, so they hadn't even announced that he was back yet, but I was at a press thing. And I met the Ultimate Warrior. 
and he, and he he was kind of limping in the room. He didn't look in the greatest of shape then. When you saw him, and I've heard other people comment this, but when you saw him at the uh, Hall of Fame in WrestleMania, and then especially on the Raw before the day before he died, he he looked like he was struggling. Just just walking looked like it was a struggle to him. Now, Ultimate Warrior is probably the most famous of the um, muscle-bound wrestlers of all time, and and it wasn't good on his heart. It like enlarged his heart and this sort of thing. And then, of course, especially as an English person speaking, there was the British Bulldog, who they said had an enlarged heart, and he died, I think, at age 38. And so you hear about these things where you see, growing up, you see these really big, and you think super healthy, super in shape guys, um, and then and then they die. They die because they're in that condition, because of perhaps some shortcuts to say, or things they did to aid getting to that level of physique. It's it's not good for them. And that's that's really unfortunate. And so to see Scott Steiner's collapse backstage is something where it's one, very worrying, and two, you're like, well, you know, was, was this always going to happen, something like this. However, not to be completely down about it, I'll come to this point, that is, if, it was, if he was going to collapse anywhere, thank heavens he collapsed backstage at a Major League Wrestling show. And I don't mean Major League Wrestling, it's not an MLW, but I just mean a big big time wrestling event and impact wrestling even though they uh, are not as big and seen as uh, the big threat to WWE that they once were they are still within the top five wrestling companies within the world probably Um, if we think about that a second WWE AEW then people will probably say New Japan Ring of Honor Uh, but it's got to be impact it's got to be so they're, they're definitely in the top five and being backstage there, you know, you'd hope and you'd pray to God that they have a doctor on hand. They have a doctor in the building, you know, specifically there to treat the wrestlers. They don't just have trainers, they've got doctors. WWE did, and Jerry King Lawler had a heart attack live on Raw when he was doing commentary within an hour of having a six-man tag match or tag team match or something. Uh, in about 2012, 2013. And again, thank heavens, it happened there. Because when you think of Eddie Guerrero, who had like a massive heart attack and died, he was in his hotel room and he wasn't discovered for many hours. Jerry Lawler had a heart attack. He was sat next to Michael Cole. Michael Cole muted his audio, uh, alerted the trainers, the doctors got to him, saved his life. Scott Steiner, he had whatever the issue was, and it it saved his life. Um, well, touch wood, it, the, they're saying that he's going to make a hundred percent recovery. So let's hope that because we don't, we still don't know what this means. But the point is, they've you know seemingly saved his life. That he's not in any risk or danger now. He's he's had some heart procedure, is what we understand of it, and he's going to be okay. Now, I don't know what that will mean for the long term, if it means that he's going to be able to continue wrestling, but we'll we'll come back to that in a moment. But I'll just continue the thought that if he wasn't at a uh, wrestling show, then he may not have got the help he needed. And also, this might be not saying that he you know, has been uncareful in recent times, but it might be the wake-up call that if he is still making wrestling appearances, that perhaps he needs to either cut back on these a bit more or he needs to um, get himself checked out. Just get like a you know an annual or six month physical. You know, just get an MOT done just to see what his health status is and you know what what changes does he need to make? Does he drink? Does he smoke? Is he eating the right things? And I'm sure again, you look at someone like Scott Steiner. It's like, well, look at that physique, and you know he's got to be doing the right things. But there are also times when you can go too far and be doing the wrong things. So, anyway, let's let's hope that um, Scott Steiner, you know, does well. Let's let's speak a moment just about rather than the health scare side of things. Talk about my memories of Scott Steiner. So, 
again I've been watching wrestling since I was four so I remember the Steiner brother, brothers first in WCW and they were like world tag team champions and I first saw like the Frankensteiner which again seems such a ordinary move today but no one else was doing it and quite possibly one no one else could at the time and two it was it was his move and people weren't going to just take and steal his his finisher so it's an amazing thing that he got this move um that he made famous maybe he didn't absolutely originated if it came from Japan or somewhere. I don't know the backstory on it entirely. Just something in the back of my mind makes me think that there may have been claims so oh someone else had done it first and he would have got it from there. Whatever. It's the Frankensteiner. People call it a hurricane rana, but it's it is always to me a Frankensteiner. I remember that you'd sometimes get like in video games like um WWF the arcade game uh, WrestleMania, the, ar- the arcade game, like Shawn Michaels would do a Frankenstein, and even though Scott Steiner wasn't in the game, they'd call it a Frankenstein, and that's because of what it was. It was only like when the Hardy Boys were there that I seem to remember them suddenly calling it a Hurricane Rana. Like WCW, they always called it a Frankenstein for the most part, and Scott Steiner would get mad if they didn't call it a Frankenstein. It's the Frankenstein. I saw a clip on Twitter of Scott Steiner supposedly inventing, whether or not that's true or not, I don't know, the 450 Splash. But it was something which was very old, you know, probably early 1990s Scott Steiner doing a 450 Splash. And the interesting thing about it is he did this forward flip, landed to his toes, and then sort of rolled forward and did a splash because either he didn't get the distance on it, you know, it's still brand new and he hadn't worked out how to get the distance, Or it was always the plan that I'm going to land on my feet and then splash you because if I just splash you after doing a forward flip off the top rope, I'm probably going to kill us both. So it was amazing to see that he was doing it. Innovative guy. Of course, they went to the WWF um, and that's, you know, where I saw a lot of them for a couple of years because uh, they'd they won the World Tag Team Championships there. I think they lost them to Quebecers. So PCO, current... Well, no, not current. Lost it a couple of weeks ago. The current Ring of Honor star, former Ring of Honor World Champion. Um, and then, obviously, they went back to WCW <clears throat> and eventually joined the NWO and Scott Rick and Scott Steiner. Uh, split up as a tag team, and Scott Steiner definitely... Um, was the the breakout star of that team. Not that Rick Steiner didn't have success. I think he definitely won a uh, World Television Championship, maybe a US title, I'm not certain. I think World TV, actually. Uh, St- Scotty won the uh, US title, was a big featured person in the NWO, but it actually took until WCW started losing and um, had lost some of their stars where they suddenly decided, OK, we're going to run with Scott Steiner. As as our world champion, as our main event, and they should have done. They should have pulled the trigger on that. I think possibly up to two years sooner than they did, because if Scott Steiner's becoming world champion in the year two thousand, then when he suddenly had his new look, the genetic freak, and in big part of the NWO, he would have seemed like this even younger guy. But this young guy, that suddenly this breakout star who'd been in WWF, had been a tag team wrestler, been in WCW, and suddenly he's going to be like replacing Hogan as not like replacing him but stepping into the world title picture as the representative of the NWO and they could have done that and that would have actually helped the NWO uh, last longer than it did not not for the reason that well they just needed to put the title on Scott Steiner but imagine if the NWO uh, it started with Hogan as world champion but then it had transitioned to either a Kevin Nash as world champion or a Scott Steiner as world champion and then like Hogan had his different feuds but it wasn't always for the belt it's because they kept things exactly the same with Hogan as the main player but, and this is what WCW did wrong they didn't make new stars is often what was said yeah you had Goldberg but that was that was the rarity so after Hogan had feuded with Sting and that either went well or didn't go well depending on your opinion I imagine Sting won the title held it for quite a while 
but then Scott Steiner stepped up and took it. Hogan could then move on to a feud with someone else, Goldberg, Macho Man, you know, whoever else. But then Steiner could be another main eventer. So you then have a main event with Hogan, a main event with Steiner for the world title. They should have done this earlier. But um, obviously one of the things that was great about Steiner was his, his theme music. So when he reached the big pop of pomp stage in WCW, his it was just police sirens, and that's great. Just like, you know, this guy, you hear the police sirens, and you know that this dangerous dude is there. And WWE, later, when he'd turn up there, still used police sirens for his theme, and then I think the TNA version of his music was the best, because he had got this other... Other than just the sirens, it got some other elements to the soundtrack in it, other music, which I think made it better. I'm not going to hum it for you, but you can you can Google it, you can look it up on YouTube, and you'll see that Scott Steiner's TNA theme, I think, was the best version of it. But of course, I, I backtrack. He did, of course, go to TNA, and that's what led us to talking about this whole thing happened backstage at the reunion show for TNA. But before that, he was in WWE again as a main eventer, came into feud with Triple H, and they really they really ruined Scott Steiner here in WWE. He was a main eventer, didn't have the best matches. I don't know what health stuff he'd got going on, but he was against Triple H, and it was Triple H's fault because the things they did in the feud, one, weren't great. Two, Triple H actually, at this time especially, wasn't that great. I'll justify that in a moment. Um, but also, just the politics of it. So, Scott Steiner came in. He was a great matchup to Triple H, but he doesn't want Triple H doesn't want a guy that's got a better physique than him. Um, similar themed character, <coughs> nasty, mean, tough guy, muscle guy to take his spot. So I think Triple H ensured that these matches weren't going to be great. And it'd be seen that Steiner's the new element, and he must have been the thing that went wrong. Because you look at Triple H's matches, he he uh, tore his quad the first time, was out uh, for many months. But before that point, before he tore his quad the first time, I always thought Triple H was a really good wrestler, really good. When he came back and he won the Royal Rumble, he defeated. Jericho for the undisputed uh, world heavyweight championship. I thought, okay, yeah, Helms is back. The match with Jericho wasn't the greatest, and then matches with Triple H weren't the greatest. I think he lost the title to Hogan of all people, but he didn't have really great matches. And it was only I think that summer when Shawn Michaels came back, and I think there's interviews where Triple H is like, yeah, so this was my first good match back and it's because it was. You watch Triple H wrestle from mid-2002 um, for the next two or three years at least right into the evolution stuff and beyond he almost never he, even though he's a muscle-bound guy he never picks up his opponents, he never body slams them, no uh, suplexes and he's just really dull, he's really flat. It would be high knee, stomp, punch, pedigree. And pedigree is not a big lifting move. Um, because your opponent jumps up, they could pedigree themselves, frankly. He just guides them. And so, Triple H didn't have the best matches. Steiner, by this stage, even at the end of WCW, wasn't having the big, the best matches. He wasn't doing the Frankensteiner anymore. Um... And so they were. It was bread and bread. They didn't have the greatest matches, and they were doing things like super pose downs or arm wrestling contests and things just to play into their physiques and that they're big muscle bound guys. And and it wasn't bad uh, in theory, but it it wasn't great in practice. And so Triple H continued in the main event picture. Steiner came in and lost his opening feud, you know, which is never a great way to kick someone off. So you bring him in straight into a world title main event, and then they lose, and it's like, well, now what? Because now they've got to go back down and build back up to it because they can't stay in that picture forever, not winning. And he ended up, I think, in a tag team with Test and maybe feuding with Test, and 
managed by Stacey Keebler and, and little bits that stick in my memory but nothing memorable until eventually he was out of the WWE he'd come into TNA and I think he was somewhat of a big deal at times there, I don't think they ever gave him a world title I think they gave him world title shots maybe but the, be- the best moment probably from the last 20 years of Scott Steiner's career just came in the now legendary Steiner Math pro, um, promo. So Scott Steiner was stood there with uh, Little Petey Pump and oh, I forget the name of the, the woman stood there as well. It doesn't matter. And then the uh, interviewer. And he's saying about how he's going to be wrestling Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle. And he starts breaking down the mathematics of his chances of winning versus Samoa Joe's chances of winning in particular. And he says that Samoa Joe's like this fat guy and he's a genetic freak, and Kurt Angle's an Olympic um, gold medalist, so normally in a match with him, uh, with a regular guy, you'd have a 50-50 chance of winning, but because he's a genetic freak, you have at best a 33 and one-third chance of winning, because he himself has a 66 and two-thirds chance of winning, but when you add in Kurt Angle, that means at best you've got a 25 and one-third chance of winning, and it's the more it went on, the less sense it made but the more specific he became in in terms of and then I've got you know an 88 and two thirds and eight percent chance plus combined with my 77 and two thirds chance or whatever I'm, I'm making this up now I'm not remembering it it is a promo which I know a lot of people have learned I think there was a thing with Sammy Kavara was just quoting it outside a WWE event or something recently I can't remember it was weird um But yeah, so, you know, and what's interesting about that is you can do something nowadays, like a promo, which lots of people would say is a botch, and you can can run with it, you can sell t-shirts on it, you can, you know, make memes and all kinds of things. So Scott Steiner doesn't need to still be going in the ring, and and, and when you look at him, it's amazing, because when you look at him when he was in WCW towards the end, and how big and jacked up he looked, and then you see him in WWE, and then in TNA... He basically still looks like the genetic freak Scott Steiner. But when you've seen him return to Impact Wrestling or on NWA Power within the last year, he looks different. And and it's hard to break down because he still he flexes his biceps and they still look big. But he's definitely not as big as he was. His shoulders aren't as big. His legs seem weirdly thicker. Like, his calves, you know, it's just like... And again, this is going to sound like I'm being mean, but it's got, like, this sort of cankle element to it where it's just like this thick, round thing. It doesn't have the definition it once did. Um, and it, and he just looks significantly smaller where it's happened within the time space of a couple of years. And it's weird, and I think he's even... You know, he might be better off for it, I don't know. But I think even there was a thing about... I saw on YouTube where it was like Scott Steiner does a Frankensteiner in 2019. And it's like, that's incredible because he didn't do them after about 1998. And then suddenly in TNA, he suddenly whipped out in a cage match that he did a Frankensteiner. And he kind of, he did it and everyone appreciated that he did it. But it wasn't like a standing, jumping uh, Frankensteiner after bouncing someone off the ropes. It's that someone was sat on the top. Uh, turnbuckle, he climbed up in front of them, grabbed the side of the cage to aid his and aim his jump so that he just jumped up pulling like a pull up, pulled his weight up hooked his legs and did the Frankenstein off the top rope which you know is even greater height that he has to fall and his opponent has to fall but he did use something to help him get the the jump in but I think he's even done some since from the top rope where he hasn't used cage <clears throat> I don't think he's done any standing Frankensteiners in the ring again um, but yeah kudos to him and maybe he can do that a bit better if he's lost a little bit of the mass but he's a guy <clears throat> who understood how he needed to change his wrestling style so if he's this muscle guy he doesn't need to be doing uh, high flying moves like Frankenstein he didn't obviously need to even, not that I'd seen it at the time, crack out this 450 splash, he could think, well, I'm going to do a Steiner recliner. I'm just going to sit on your back, I'm going to hook your arms over my knees, and I'm going to grab your chin, and I'm just going to pull on it. And that's all he needed to do. Uh, he could drop an elbow, 
he could um, do his poses, his taunts with his uh, muscles and where he should be pinning someone, but instead he starts doing push-ups, just get heat from the crowd. And, and yeah, he's a really good wrestler. But um, the main thing I want to say, though, again, not that I expect to hear it, but like, I wish nothing but the best for the recovery of Scott Steiner. So now we've covered the Scott Steiner topic. Let's have a little look what else is happening in the wrestling world. Because like I said, this is going to be slightly different. Scott Steiner was our main subject. and We've spoken about it for the last 20 minutes or so. Let's just have a little look what's on some of the wrestling news websites, some of the stories. I'm not just going to be plagiarizing and lifting the stories, but I will credit uh, at least the websites just to look at the headlines and give some thoughts along the way. So some of the websites, and by all means, give me the recommendations. What are the wrestling websites you go to for daily news? There's WrestleZone. There's E-Wrestling News is quite good. And also another one I've got open, which I don't often go to, is WrestlingInc.com. And so one thing here, having mentioned Triple H earlier, is it says that Triple H was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Arnold Classic by Arnold Schwarzenegger himself. That's cool. Uh, I don't know how much Arnold and Triple H have a personal relationship. I know that there was some angle on the maybe debut edition of SmackDown with Arnold Schwarzenegger in 1999. And I think probably with Triple H, and there may have been rumours Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to wrestle Triple H, but tying back into what I said about Steiner, uh, he, you know, Arnold had to have like some heart procedure or something, or just had one, and his wife wouldn't let him actually wrestle which was a big shame that was a huge loss that Arnold Schwarzenegger never wrestled a match ever it would have been great if it could have happened in 1991 so imagine if imagine how things would have been different for wrestling if Arnold Schwarzenegger had turned up at the Survivor Series 1991 and instead of moving into things with um Papa Shango and Ric Flair you know the main and like and Ric Flair versus Macho Man, which was a great match at WrestleMania 8. But imagine if it had moved into Hulk Hogan versus Arnold Schwarzenegger at WrestleMania 8. That would have been incredible. But anyway, so Triple H, you know, he's this big muscle guy, like I said, and now he's got this Lifetime Achievement Award because he's almost certainly going to have been someone that's been on a lot of the muscle and fitness magazines and featured regularly in, in the weightlifting and bodybuilding world. And so, yeah, good for Triple H. Not much more I need to say on that. Uh, let's see what else is coming up. Oh, yeah, Brandy Rhodes. Brandy Rhodes has got a new tattoo. And it's a neck tattoo. I actually tweeted, and you should follow me up for my wrestling tweets that I put out at the Superkick Mania, uh, as in the Superkick Mania Pro Wrestling Podcast. I wonder how I came up with that Twitter handle. The interesting thing is I came up with the Twitter handle first and then decided to do a podcast. <clears throat> But anyway, um, I tweeted to Brandy Rhodes because she said, oh, she's got a surprise for people, something different, something she's been thinking about for a long time. I was like, as long as it's not a neck tattoo, and it was a neck tattoo, it is a neck tattoo. Now, if you don't get the significance of it, it's because Cody Rhodes, her husband, at the AEW uh, Revolution pay-per-view, revealed that he'd got a ginormous neck tattoo, which was his nightmare family uh, symbol, so like his Rhodes family, his company um, symbol tattooed at like an awkward angle on his neck and it's red, it's got it's like a skull with wings coming out of it, maybe a crown, I forget exactly but it's that shape but then with the US flag on it and it looks really uh, really awkward because it's red and blue and it's just it's, it's not the best looking, people will get used to it but he he should have had this, you know, on his arm. This would have looked perfect on his arm in the same position where Goldberg has his tribal pattern tattoo. This would have looked great on his uh, one of his shoulders or bigger, like Brock Lesnar across his entire back. People would have been like, "Oh my god, that's in, uh, that's amazing! What a huge, elaborate tattoo!" Although just for the color of it, people would have probably still been like, "Yeesh." But still, it would have been impressive. He could have had it on his chest, like how he wore his Star Trek costume and had a Star Trek badge. Um, but he had it on his neck. And now Brandy Road has come out. And, and like the thing was, actually, just to backtrack, with his match with MJF at Revolution, 
the main thing people were talking about was the tattoo. So there's a time and a place for everything, and it kind of distracted from this final payoff match after this long two or three month feud. But anyway, Brandy Rhodes has revealed she's had a tattoo, and it's not quite a neck tattoo. Technically it is, but it's more just behind her ear, and it's of a Mickey Mouse symbol. So good for her. It's a baby neck tattoo. It's it's nothing too offensive, intrusive, and also people can, can do whatever the hell they like. But if you're going to be a public figure and do these things, then people such as myself and so many others on the internet are going to comment on it. So, yeah, that was about Brandy Rhodes' new tattoo. Um, what else? Hmm. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so here's here's a big thing. Let's just bring up another website just so I can run through this. So, tonight is the WWE pay-per-view uh, Elimination Chamber. If I'd, I hadn't even actually thought of this until... I knew it was happening, but I just hadn't thought of it. Um, when I was starting this podcast because I certainly would have tagged this podcast with Elimination Chamber preview and predictions so let's let's do a few of those now just to wrap things up so agree and proceed I'm on the WWE.com website let's just bring up the uh, the card so WWE pay-per-view and oh no that's the that's the network where it's saying I can watch Super Showdown what an amazing card that was I love that Goldberg won. Listen to the previous episode and you'll hear why. But uh, just because these things aren't going to happen, I'd love it if Scott Steiner came back and won the World Heavyweight Championship. So shows, let's, let's see if, can I bring up shows? So Raw, SmackDown, NXT, Elimination Chamber. Just loading up the card. Now obviously this is a pay-per-view that's had a lot of changes to it that we suspect and are aware of because um, things changed with Goldberg coming in, getting huge ratings... For WWE and them taking the belt off of Wyatt and then just deciding we're going to run with Roman Reigns versus Goldberg. We're not even going to have a Elimination Chamber match to decide the number one contender. It's just going to be straight in. And so they've changed things. So the matches we've got for it, there's got to be more than this. But it says that there's the SmackDown Tag Team Championship Elimination Chamber match. Um, and and I think that's really exciting. I'll, I'll break it down more in a moment. But the change from having the number one contender for, at the time, Bray Wyatt's Universal Championship, now Goldberg's Universal Championship, it's like we expected something like that. We'd already know that Roman Reigns is going to win. But now it's, it's going to be a tag team match, which is going to put more guys in the ring. Some of these guys are more athletic. It's going to probably be a more interesting match. We also have a three-on-one Intercontinental title match what seriously it's not for the championship though it can't be for the championship Braun Strowman versus Shinsuke Nakamura Cesaro and Sami Zayn three on one handicap match but is if the title's not on the line what's what's the benefit of this to Shinsuke etc except for obviously they try and kick uh, Braun's butt but are these the only matches that have been announced I know okay so Drew Gulak versus Daniel Ryan. I don't even remember that that match was announced. So, what else will there be? What else? The only other match that I can see that's listed, and I know there will be more. It's just the WWE's website isn't the best at just listing. Here's the lineup of matches. Um, there will also be the Street Profits against Buddy Murphy and Seth Rollins. So, whoop de doo This isn't a very exciting pay-per-view coming up. Hold that for one second, guys. Sorry about that. I just had to mute it one second just whilst I checked on something. So, okay. Let's let's have a look anyway. Uh, so we've got the SmackDown Tag Team Championship Elimination Chamber match. And let's run through everyone who's in it. So it's Miz and Morrison versus uh, the Usos, Jimmy and Jay, versus the New Day, which is Big E and Kofi Kingston version of this. And then we've got Lucha House Party. Um, and then we've got Otis and Tucker. And then, lastly not least, we've got Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler. For this, I predict that the Miz and Morrison need to retain. 
Now, they could lose to someone and set up a rematch at WrestleMania, but I predict at WrestleMania we're going to end up with some sort of three or four way match with these tag teams anyway. Probably, quite possibly a ladder match, who knows. But I would like to see out of these that perhaps Kofi and Big E win, because otherwise, after last year, Kofi Mania, Kofi is suddenly now just going to be in a tag team title match at WrestleMania where he's trying to win the title, and he could win the title at Mania, but if he wins the tag team titles at WrestleMania a year after Kofi Mania, it's just a huge step down. If he goes in as champion, then at least he's gone in as a champion. He can hold his head up somewhat higher, you know, that they've completely disrespected him uh, in the way they took him out of the world title picture. And it was disrespect. They could have exited him into a different storyline, transitioned him away much more grace- more gracefully than they did. But anyway, Miz and Morrison, they could win just because obviously Morrison's not long back, but he's long enough back so that he doesn't have to win to go in as a winner at WrestleMania. But it's, it's, it's a nice thing, which this should be a main event. It may not be the main event. Oh, of course, there's the women's elimination chamber match. I don't mean to laugh when I say that, but when I say, oh, what are the other matches? It's it's blindingly obvious um, what the other match is, or at least what that other match was going to be. So anyway, let's let's bring up a different website that's going to give the full rundown of things. So okay, like I said, Daniel Bryan, Drew Gulak. Brian needs to win. Drew Gulak is not there yet. And you don't. This is a problem WWE always have where they try and get someone there by just having them beat someone that they shouldn't, by all rights, beat yet. You can build someone up with some competitive matches, and then later on, you can have them beat someone. But I hate when they sacrifice someone like a Daniel Bryan, like how over the years they'd sacrifice Matt Hardy or sacrifice uh, Christian or. Um, like Veruk or someone just by having someone come in and destroy them, beat them, make humiliate them. I, mean, like, I don't know who this person is, they're not all that great and they're not ready and Drew Gulak is not ready to beat Daniel Bryan. So then we have uh, the Women's Elim- Elimination Chamber match. Uh, Natty Neidhart, Liv Morgan, Shayna Baszler, Oscar, Ruby Wright and Sarah Logan. Hmm. Now, it's, it's got to be Shayna Baszler. Shayna Baszler is absolutely the winner of this. Where she'll come in into the match, I'm not sure. There's a chance that she could start it, but I think they'll more have the sense of, oh, now she's in the match, now things are going to get real. And so I think Shayna Baszler will probably come out fourth. I think she'll come out fourth, just so that I think there'll be the match it will be a tale of two matches the match before Shayna Baszler gets in the match and the match after Shayna Baszler gets in the match just as a guess I'm going to predict that uh, the first eliminated will be Sarah Logan Um, last eliminated I'm going to guess Natty just because you know Natty Neihart she's a heart Um, so if you you have her to the end then it will really make it seem like Shayna Baszler has overcome like the best in the ring to to, to win it. Um, I didn't say about the <clears throat> the tag team elimination chamber match. I think the first... Okay, it's just a prediction of who will be first in, first last out. So I'm going to predict that the New Day should win, although I think it may be Miz and Morrison as well, but my prediction will be for New Day. And I think... The first eliminated will absolutely be Lucha House Party. And the last eliminated, if the New Day win, it will be Miz and Morrison. If it's Miz and Morrison, again, it should be the New Day. But I think Heavy Machinery with Osis are going to surprise people. And imagine if they won. Imagine if, heavy, even though they've done stupid storylines with Otis, which, you know, they've been good and they've gone down well, but... These guys, look at the size of them. They could be the new natural disasters. They could be like up there with the Legion of Doom in that you know they just destroy everyone. But instead, they do silly storylines. But um, heavy machinery, they could be made from this match, but they probably won't. But we'll see. So, is it for the actual Intercontinental Title? This is amazing because what happens? It says three on one handicap match, WWE Intercontinental Championship match. 
See, I haven't I haven't paid attention to this on SmackDown just so as they even announced the match, but whatever. Um, I think Braun has to win because otherwise that's going to be too confusing of who's the Intercontinental Champion unless they have all the heels turn on each other and out of them you could make Cesaro a face again. I'd love for Shinsuke to actually get a world title one day as a face because that's what should have happened years ago with AJ. Um, but whatever. Uh, Street Profits versus Seth and Murphy. I think Seth and, Mur- Seth and Murphy, Mur- Murphy need to win because otherwise what are they doing at WrestleMania? Um, Andrade versus Humberto. Okay, so I'd forgotten this match was happening as well. I think Andrade is going to keep it. You know, they're not going to keep this feud going into WrestleMania, but I'm not sure what they are going to do with that championship towards WrestleMania. They just need to get away from this. And then, of course, there's Alistair Black and AJ Styles. Now, my prediction from this is that um, they want Alistair Black to be the next Undertaker and he could be he's got the tattoos he's gingerish yeah I think I think that's fair to say brown gingerish hair he's got the death stare he rises from like a coffin I don't like the whole cross leg sitting down things that's so CM Punk and it only worked for that one promo of CM Punk because then when CM Punk got in the ring and was sat cross legged it just looks stupid so the one time he did it was fair enough since then it's not a good idea to do your promos whilst sat cross-legged in the ring but anyway I think that the Undertaker's match at Wrestlemania won't be AJ Styles versus the Undertaker I think it will be AJ Styles Gallows and Anderson the OC versus the Undertaker and Alistair Black and it will be somewhat a passing of the torch thing from uh, Alistair Black to the Undertaker imagine if they have those two team for the next year um, so there's a few matches here and there so Alistair Black's being attacked and then Dong and The Undertaker comes out that would be great and of course it could then transition to perhaps a final Undertaker match at Wrestlemania next year against Alistair Black and the true passing of the torch so anyway, that's my thoughts I think that Alistair Black is going to maybe lose and then The Undertaker will come out for AJ or that AJ will lose and then the OC will attack and then Undertaker will come out and then it will set up the tag team match regardless but after AJ losing just with one move which was ridiculous at Super Showdown then AJ should get this win back just to just to boost him up not that AJ Styles who's just been voted like wrestler of the decade um forget what that was wrestling observer I think um you know, he he doesn't need boosting up, but after a stupid loss like that, it wouldn't hurt, hurt to have a have a, a decent win heading into Mania. So anyway, these are some thoughts. I've gone over some random stuff. I'm definitely going to do some more episodes like this in the future where I just pull some things up from the internet, from Twitter, from Facebook, whatever, and I'll just give my take on it. And yeah, let me know what you think. This is the Superkick Mania Pro Wrestling Podcast. My name, as always is David Pstansky and I just want to remind everyone that there are lots and lots of podcasts as part of the Extreme Improv Pro Wrestling sorry, the Extreme Improv Podcast Network, this is the Super Kick Mania Pro Wrestling Podcast but it's not the only podcast, there's also the Mega Movie Mo- the Mega Movie Podcast there's the Games Monster Video Game Podcast and then the trilogy of Extreme Improv themed podcasts being the Extreme Improv Podcast Radio Rumble which is a live comedy panel show then there's the extreme improv chat show where i interview comedians actors and improvisers from all over the world and the extreme improv skills show where if you are interested in being an improviser yourself i'll talk about tips and ideas for how to do that it's coming up soon i promise you will be the extreme improv book club which is going to be something unlike people are expecting but there's lots and lots of good stuff out there So until next time, please do give this a share and a like and a subscribe, whether or not you're listening to this on the Extreme Improv YouTube channel, do hit subscribe over there, or if you'll subscribe to us on one of the podcast apps, we want to uh, build this up and you can help us doing this. If you've listened to me for this long, then just tell other people to listen as well. It all helps. So thank you very much. Until next time, bye-bye.